uh, start with a short introduction. Thanks for coming to my talk, by the way. Um, I'm uh, James Collins. I'm the lead web developer at Associated Employers. Um, we're a little small company that works on uh, business to business products in Billings, Montana. Um, in the past, I've had the ability to work on real estate applications, e-commerce, um, health applications as well, um, and ship software across the, across the world. Um, it's the picture of me and my son, Chip. Um, when I'm not being a dad, I like to uh, run around and uh, call it exercise, and you'll find me uh, tinkering on a CNC or 3D printer. So uh, I can talk about why I decided to do a talk about accessibility. <clears throat> it seems like one of the least attractive topics when it comes to tech, um, but it could possibly be one of the most important. Um, so what is accessibility in context for the web? Um, I'm going to define it as accessibility um, is the intent to provide use, ease of use to users that aren't fully visually capable. Um, as developers, we sometimes are given the opportunity to provide web applications to our communities, our state, and our nation. It's, it's important and our responsibility that we keep all of our users in mind. Um, I really want to do this talk because accessibility is really ignored um, in most cases or done really poorly. Um, I want to learn more about accessibility as well. Um, sometimes teaching is the best way to, uh, to learn. Um, also, I've never worked personally with a user experience tester um, or a QA engineer that's visually incapable. Um, so I'd like to pinpoint on things we can do to optimize before we get to that step. So I have a few goals for my talk today. Um, I was hoping to give you guys a better understanding of existing web technologies when it comes to accessibility. Um, I've learned a few things from several people that consider themselves experts, and I'd like to pass that on to you. Um, and I'd like to inspire you guys to uh, go through and go through and audit your own app's accessibility. So, the majority of users that you help with accessibility in mind aren't blind. Blindness tends to be one, just one condition. Um, this is a quote from a uh, article detailing a few different common types of um, color confusion. Um, deuteranopia is a red-green color blindness, really really common. Um, I'd like to uh, show you what it looks like a little bit. Um, so this is kind of pink on this projector, but it's dead red, and to the left of it's dead green. Um, this menu is using these colors to distinguish links apart from each other instead of some spacing in between there. Um, if I apply a deuteranopia filter, you'll see that they become dead similar. There's no way to uh, differentiate. Um, if these links are close enough together, they might look like one link. So, another common visual impairment besides red-green colorblindness or any of the others is uh, simply low vision. Poor vision can come from numerous things, and I think most of us will know at least one person in our lives with one of these conditions. Um, personally, my father has diabetic uh, retinopathy. Um, that condition causes blurry vision and floating dark spots. He still works for a living, and it's important that he's able to browse the web, even if he's still visually uh, impaired. So I want to give you an example of a banking application. It's a great banking application. Um, it's asking the user to uh, approve or deny a transaction to Pablo Escobar for the sum of $5,200. Um, the readability score for these buttons 
is definitely not great. And actually on the projector, I can't even see them very well. Um, furthermore, the text is too long to be seen by a magnifying glass tool on Mac OS. So if you imagine being this user that's trying to use a magnifying glass tool, you're having to scroll across the whole button to see what the text is. Um, top that with the fact that they're probably seeing something like this, um, and you get a recipe for a Colombian disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so to start with, I'd like to give you guys a basic set of rules um, that take care of most things. So keep it simple. Keep it simple is one of those things that was echoed to me by Paul Suptic at Montana Blind and Low Vision Services. Um, that's one of the things he just kept telling me after every single tip he would give me. Um, your site should be keyboard accessible and interactive elements should be tabbable. You should avoid interactive elements that automatically change content. You should always be labeling. You should ensure color contrast. You should avoid image text. You should immediately present content to the user. And lastly, you should be consistent and be primitive. We're going to talk more about all of these later. So did everybody write that down? I didn't see any heads moving. They're good. So keep it simple. <laughs> this is an actual website. This is a screenshot <laughs> taken recently of an actual website. Is this um, Maine? What's that? Is this Maine? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Seems to be arngren.net. Yeah. Like the face on the cap. Right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So this is a this is a live website. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it's designed by a guy that was using Dreamweaver, but he had like an incredibly shaky hand. Uh, <laughs> but this is uh, a simple concept. A website should prioritize actionable items to the top and cut the craft. It's important that we don't have too many actionable items as well, um, because we won't ever get to the hundredth option on this page. Um, it's hard to imagine the effort that goes into creating such a cluttered page like this, so don't overwork yourself. Keyboard access is an important a aspect for web pages. Tabability is one of those things to keep in mind when it's designing for keyboard access. If we think about our page audience, a good chunk of our users are going to be using that tab key to jump around to different elements in your form. The fact that you're optimizing for accessibility opens up that you're actually creating a win for your power users, um, people with those uh, knowledge of common browser shortcuts. Tabbing applies not only to forms, but to navigational elements as well. There's a few things to consider in regards to keyboard access. So tab index. Tab index can be a proponent of mystery meet navigation. So some of you might know how frustrating it is when you're expecting the tab key to focus the next element on the page. It's visually in line, um, but instead you're focused to an entirely different place. Um, now imagine being blind trying to fill out that form. Um, we can see in this example the use of tab index one. Uh, it's kind of dark, but tab index one on the checkbox you would expect it to line up somewhere here, right? It's your tab index one, two, three, right? Um, but it turns out there's actually a menu above this form, and tab index one puts this tab index of this checkbox way up here. Um, so this user will be filling this out and completely skip over that, and then they start tabbing through the menu, and they end up landing on this checkbox while they're tabbing through navigation. Um, drag and drop is a common pain point for key keyboard access as well. Um, solving for drag and drop accessibility can be really tough, um, and I really don't have time to explain it thoroughly here. Um, I would like to mention, though, uh, 
that area live regions can be a benefit, allowing you to dynamically update a placeholder element with some dynamic text um, when the user moves around a drag and drop list uh, could actually work. Um, I'll have more about area live regions in the next few slides. Um, if you're using drag and drop file APIs, you need to make sure that there's a focus and spacebar event. Um, sometimes if, we're, if we just have an arbitrary element on a page and we don't allow it to be tabbed and you need to accept a file input, if a user's just tabbing through that form, then blind users won't be able to upload anything. We also need to make sure that we're using, we're not taking away focus outlines. Um, those common, like just the base style of, of tabbing through a form, and you'll see that blue highlight around an element. Range sliders are sort of out of style now, um, but if you're still <laughs> using them from uh, early 2000s, then a lot of common libraries that use them um, didn't use the native HTML element. So you need to use area uh, attributes to tell a blind user what the values are um, on a range slider. <coughs> um, there's some more techniques for um, keyboard accessibility available on the uh, Web Accessibility and Mind project. Um, and I'd encourage you to check that out. So, give me one second. Let's talk about dynamic changing elements for a moment. What exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about avoiding interactive elements that automatically change content. Some examples of this might be sliders or carousels. Dynamically fetch content that loads in after the user has already started interacting with the page. Automatically updating <laughs> GPS coordinates if you have an app like that. Um, anything that could potentially change without the user um, doing some action and causes a reread of the content could be potentially bad for accessibility. It's best to avoid it, but if you really wanted to add it, I have some ways to help you. So. If you'd still like to have dynamic changing content that changes without user input, it's best to use area live regions. Unfortunately, much like eval and code, area live regions have the best intentions, but give us the ability to do horrible things to screen readers. Um, I'd like to show you an example of voiceover. So this page has a banner at the top that changes every few seconds to a different thing. Um, notice that partway through, as the screen reader is reading off this page, it just stops entirely and reads off the thing that changed at the top. So this thing at the top is using area live regions uh, with the root setting, which means it will interrupt anything that the screen reader is using. So basically, on this page, a screen reader is never going to be able to read the entire page because they're always going to be cut to that content. Think of it as somebody that won't move out of your way in traffic. Um, so obviously that, um, that slider per se, think of it as like a carousel on the previous page, um, was a horrible example, but on purpose. So how would we rework that slider for accessibility? <coughs> Um, be polite is your first rule. If you're going to use an area live region, use the polite setting. In a lot of cases, root is not really um, a good option. If we swapped content on that slider, but left the content hidden, we would want to use area hidden to get rid of that content completely. If I had like one sentence that said, I like potatoes, and the other one's welcome to my website, and I hid welcome to my website, Aria could still access that content if you didn't hide it with Aria hidden or visibility hidden. Um, we would want to add buttons for forward and back. 
maybe not automatically trigger that slide forward and back, um, but allow the user to select forward and back. If we have images in that slider instead of text, we want to make sure we use the alt type. I'd like to move on to labeling. So for something so simple to do, why would we miss out on clarity for our users? Labeling is cheap and the gains of doing so are really rich. So on this example, I have a, uh, a form field with a label for username. It's dead simple and hopefully most of us are doing this already if we design for the web. Um, username, in this example, gains some additional clarity from a label. Um, for example, enter your username for my service. Some designs don't want to include labels because maybe they're just using placeholders, right? Um, you should still be including labels in your markup, though. Um, and if you're thinking about using display none or visibility hidden for those labels, consider that those two properties will hide content for everybody, including area, uh, sorry, screen readers. So there's several approaches to hiding content for users, but leaving it open for screen readers. Try to avoid workarounds that use width and height properties because they remove an element from the screen reader's flow. Um, one of the surefire tested ways of positioning it would be positioning it off screen. In this example, 10,000 pixels to the left. To area, I still think it's in that, in that exact place you had it originally, so it can read through in the flow um, that a normal user would but your user will not see it. Um, you can create a global style like screen reader only um, and apply it to an input like this, screen reader only. And so that kind of gives uh, developers a nice way of knowing what's happening as well. Um, and this style uh, you see here is actually reminiscent of uh, Bootstrap's SR-only. Um, which is another thing if you're using bootstrap sr-only class will uh, do a similar thing and leave it in the screen readers flow. So I need to pull up the banking application from earlier. Um, in this <coughs> revision I've taken the long-winded buttons and put some sweet X and check buttons. Um, visually this is somewhat more pleasing, and I hope you'll agree. Uh, but to our screen reader, this is, this is horrible. Um, without labels, our screen reader reads each button as button. Um, so this page <laughs> looks like this to our screen reader. Uh, so to ex improve this experience, we can use area uh, label and pass content, pass content to that, and then suddenly our screen reader user will see deny and approve as buttons instead of just buttons. Um, I thought about, after making this example, how would we improve this example further um, with Arial uh, label? Something we fail to recognize, the fact that screen readers have to manually look back to see previous content. As a fully visually capable person, at any point, I can glance back to the content above and remind myself when I'm approving or denying this transaction to Pablo Escobar. This isn't as easy as uh, for screen readers. If we think about the page as a gradient of information, how much can I retain by the time I get to this button? You can see my point, point more clearly. If we added more context to our area labels and provided, and provided the full information of what the button was doing, um, the screen reader is going to see something like this instead of just approve or deny. Um, 
So yeah, using a longer area label um, gives the screen reader more context in this situation. And for your regular users, they're still just seeing the X and the check. <coughs> so let's talk about contrast. <coughs> contrast is extremely important, not only for colorblind or low vision users, but for your normal users too. Up until personally we needed to do some dynamic theming in one of our apps, I thought the contrast was a good enough approach and was subjective. Um, as it turns out, W3 Web Content Accessibility Guidelines recommends the usage of a color contrast algorithm that looks at the contrast ratio between um, two luminances. Um, the formula really isn't as complicated as it looks here, um, but the end goal is to make sure color contrast surpasses 4.5 to 1. There are a few tools on the internet that simplify this process for us. Past this, if you're using, uh, if you've already got colors on your screen on the web, then you can run a Lighthouse um, audit in the DevTools. After you run an accessibility audit, um, DevTools will give you elements that potentially have problems with um, accessibility in regards to color contrast. So it's time for a quiz, guys. Will this pass the W3 contrast accessibility guidelines? Yes. I want to see it. No. It will not. It's a 2.6. Let's go back. It's a 2.66 uh, to 1 ratio, which is brutally below <laughs> our. Uh, are suggested 4.5. So next one. Can you read me? No. Good spot. It's actually more than the previous example, believe it or not. It's harder to read, right? Let's fail. How about this one? Yes. It looks the same. It looks the same. Exactly the same. I can't tell it. <laughs> so a darker green than the first one. Um, the projector is doing a little bit of weirdness with it, but it's pretty close. Um, so it's actually at 4.7. We're right above that guideline. So that's bad. Um, how about this one? Yes. Yes? Good. This is 7.1. So that's almost double. All right, so <laughs> hopefully those examples illustrate why, why it's not ex extremely possible to eyeball contrast. Um, sure, it might be good enough to eyeball it, but following these contrast ratio guides are going to give you a peace of mind that all of your readers can read your content. Because it's more than just how it looks to you, it's how it looks in a monochrome how it looks in a deuteranopia state, prodenopia state, um, all these different conditions. And comparing the ratios via luminance um, is going to give you a way better result. So, I'm going to pick on some people. Um, image text is another area where people struggle. Back in the days of plain old HTML design, table layouts, um, people used to make images to make page content look great. I ran up on a great example the other day from Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. It's a large organization, very cool people that write books for children. Um, I'm not here to bully anybody, but this happened to be a great example. In this example, I'm scrolling through their content and it looks really good um, for a children's book <laughs> illustrator uh, group. Then I noticed that everything on this page for this whole conference was an image. Each one of these blocks is a different image. And to top that, none of them had an alt tag. So everything from the conference schedule to the hotel details to who's speaking was an image without an alt tag. 
So that means to a screen reader, this page is really simple. Uh, it's a page with a navigation at the top <laughs> with a bunch of links that go to other pages with the navigation with links back to where you were. Um, not a single word by the screen reader. I, re I ran through it with the screen reader. Not a single word of meaningful content about a conference was spoken on this page. So, those images may look good, and you may get easy layout wins, but it's really not worth it if you have a low vision or blind audience. It's fine, I'll just, I'll just use alt tags if I've got images. It allows us to give us uh, screen readers text to read, <coughs> and that's great for images that may need to contain text, but in our example, there's just too much content, and we lose the flow of text as it's being read. Remember that alt text is read together as one block, but big text isn't read as a heading. It's just more body content. So, from the example, this is at the top of the conference. Um, this could actually be alt tagged pretty efficiently. Um, in theory, it could still be HTML content, um, but maybe this was sent to an artist that came back with an image and they embedded the text. Sure, that works. For the schedule, on the other hand, that is also an image, um, I think we'd better just start over and write it just at HTML. One small thing I wanna mention is that you should avoid content that's hidden behind interaction. Take, take this example of a simple news layout where we have some image tiles with an article title. Say my designer came to me and said, hey, can we hide the titles until they're hovered on? As a developer, I'd say, sure, anything's possible. So I go and I implement the design and I come up with a sick hover style that uses visibility hit. A screen reader never sees the title and the user can't hover to uh, show the title. If you're a screen reader user, you can't hover to show the title. Using this uh, area label, like we've seen before, will work to fix this scenario. But in many cases, we should just avoid content like this. Um, plus, the original design was more user-friendly and allows the users to get a sense of what they're looking at without more interaction. All right, consistency and primitives. So be consistent. Your uh, site might have slight quirks that your user has to figure out. If you change that per page, they have to relearn your quirks. If your form has labels on the bottom, don't make a new form that styles them to have it on the right or above on the left. Humans are awesome and they figure things out, but figuring the same thing out over and over again is just frustrating. So, the last rule I want you guys to remember is to stick with primitive tags. Always be using HTML elements that are built into the browser. Browsers and screen readers have optimized for accessibility when it comes to most elements, and markup is key to designing with accessibility in mind. If I have a list, use UL, OL, and use list items. Don't use divs without a role attribute. If you want to use divs, use the role attribute. Um, use inputs properly. Um, use selects properly as well. Um, we actually have a framework we use, maybe somebody's heard of it, Semantic UI. Um, Semantic UI uses divs for selects and by default, they're not accessible. And they have an issue right now out for that. Um, in our own apps, we've had to add more JavaScript to make them behave like a normal select. Um, so it's best to just find a framework that uses selects. Um, use landmark um, tags like nav, section, header, um, h1, h2, and so on are going to give your users um, kind of like an important, uh, important. but like I said, if you, if you remove that and you just 
use like a P tag and scale it to a heading size, uh, the screen reader is going to think that that's just more body text and won't present that to the user as something important. So, why should you guys care? When I first thought about doing this talk, I reached out to a blind man, blind man named Pat. I knew through a friend. Um, Pat is a bridge engineer for a government agency and one of the most qualified structural engineers in his region. A blind man designing bridges. That's scary. <laughs> this isn't the only incredible thing Pat has done. He's also a runner, and he has the Missoula Marathon under his belt. Um, actually, one of my one of my friends guided him um, through that mar marathon. Um, that said, when I asked Pat about his struggles with the web, he responded with this: Whenever I need stuff looked up on the internet, I usually assign it to one of my designers to look up. I don't surf the web at all. And talking about their work software. Our software's consistent updates bring it with uh, inconsistencies and hard to see colors that have no contrast. Sometimes when they create a page in a program, it does not follow a consistent template. This causes great pain because with zoom text, I have to search in circles and try to find it. It's try like trying to locate a dinghy in the ocean. People who are well-sighted do not think about contrast or other accessibility issues that even poor-sighted older people would appreciate. Um, so this is a real person with real talent. And every day, he's struggling with issues like contrast and consistency. Small issues that wreck his entire day. Um, at the Missoula Marathon, my friend that ran with him um, ran in front of him to make sure he knew where he was going. And by the end of the marathon, Pat had just ran a marathon. Um, imagine if the web was built like, like guiding people on a marathon. Imagine if it was built for people like Pat. Um, we can empower people like Pat with visual, visual disabilities to accomplish great things. Um, it's our responsibility as we build our circles of the internet to put our shoes and uh, put our feet in shoes of people like Pat. Um, I challenge you after Big Sky Devcon to try out VoiceOver and another screen reader um, or any other screen reader uh, on your own site <coughs> and see if you can navigate it without visual help. There's a sea of HTML uh, accessibility attributes designed to help every scenario. And I encourage you to delve deeper if you're struggling to provide usable pages to screen readers. So, I'm a little bit fast, but um, questions will be great.